Hello, BookTube, and welcome back to Epic Comic Book Wednesday. This is a world's finest collaboration between Michael K. Vaughn and myself, where we combine the forces of Stately Vaughn Manor and Hyde Cottage to talk about comic books. Some comic book artist, a theme, a time period, a run on issues, a concept, whatever Mike wants to talk about. I horned my way into his innocent tour of his own Marvel Epic collections years ago, and because of that, he gets to pick what we talk about. And we have skipped Epic Comic Book Wednesday for a while. Uh, we are now coming to a return to form. The one, one complication after another has gotten the way of these videos going out to the three people who enjoy them so much. <laughs> uh, so I think it was in, in part that and in part for one other reason uh, that we're going right back to form here with an Epic collection. The Epic collection is a full-color paperback reprint line of Marvel Comics that they did. A weird counterpart to their ongoing Marvel Masterwork series, which are hardcover editions that are progressing in a stately fashion, chronologically through time from the beginning of the so-called Marvel Comics era, which started with the Fantastic Four, number one, Stan Lee and Jack Kirby, uh, and moved on from there as Stan Lee invented an entire pantheon of uh, original Marvel characters. Uh, but the Fantastic Four was first. And the Marvel Masterwork series has, has taken every one of those canonical appearances of characters, and also older, from the, the, comic, the comic book company that Marvel was before it was Marvel, and just started sequentially repeating them, reprinting them in full color in hardcover editions. The, the Epic Collections don't do that. They're full color, but they're not hardcover, and also they're not sequential. They bounce all around depending on uh, whatever the editor feels like doing, whatever period the editor feels like spotlighting uh, in any comic. Even, uh, there are even a whole bunch of, of epic collections now that are very modern, the things from the last 10 years. Uh, well, not the last 10 years, because <laughs> there were no good comics in the last 10 years, but you know what I mean. Recent comics. Uh, and... The numbering reflects that. The, the, when these things were announced, it was announced that they would not be going in chronological order. So you could technically say by uh, a Hulk epic collection and the, the very first Hulk epic collection to appear, the one that you, that you want to buy, the very first one that's ever existed, would have on the spine the number four. <laughs> because it was they have this weird grand plan for how all these things are going to go together. Uh, that made the Epic Collection fun right from the beginning. But another thing I noticed right from the beginning is that, boy, oh, boy, uh, it do, do, does Marvel put a lot of care into these things. It's kind of weird. The folks that put out the Marvel Epic Collection line must be working remotely in Hoboken. They cannot be working in the Marvel offices. The kind of care and attention to detail and valuing the customer that is evident in every spec, every re aspect of the Epic Collections is totally absent from the Marvel Comics floppy comic book line, the weekly color comics that come out every week. Totally absent from there. Those comics show a, a, a willful ignorance, not just an ignorance, but a willful ignorance of the entire back catalog of Marvel Comics. Who cares? Pew, pew, one punch. I, I want to talk about food and how horrible your grandparents were. I don't want to talk about, what's his name again? Professor Doom? <laughs> I want to talk about that. And I'm in charge because I'm neurodiverse, or or whatever. Uh, a whole bunch of, of really good comic writers and comic artists just sitting on the sidelines, unemployed, and just astounded by what is going on here. Uh, but that is not the Epic Collection. The Epic Collection is amazing. And I noticed right from the beginning that although these things are expensive, they tend to be about $40 for a, a thick paperback, you get a lot for that. You get a carefully curated, wonderfully designed collection and usually extras. Usually you get extras in the back. Stuff that's connected to what's going on. It's certainly not uh, as remorselessly forward marching as the Marvel Masterwork series. The editors know what they're doing and can bounce around inside a collection to give you, to pull together all the stuff you really want in connection with the issues they're reprinting. Marvelous, marvelous stuff, no pun intended. Uh, and so I got a lot of epic collections uh, over the years. I have a little shelf of them. Michael K. Vaughn has a room of them. I have, I have a little shelf of them. One thing that I have learned, I didn't really know it before BookTube, 
but now since Epic Comic Book Wednesday, I now know it for a fact, which is that Epic collections, unlike the Marvel Masterwork series, tend to go up in value the longer they're around. So there's an Epic collection almost every week out from Marvel, and if you see one that you want, and it, it maybe a copy is coming to your local comic book shop, your LCS, and you're thinking, do I want that or do I not? It's almost $50. That's, that's, no, small, that's no small inventory in the weekly budget. Do I really want it or don't? <laughs> I'm, I'm not saying that you shouldn't consult that. You should always ask that question. Do I really want this or do I not? But that Epic Collection stands a good chance of being twice or even three times that much money the minute it goes out of print. That I in, in the course of Epic Comic Book Wednesday, Mike and I have talked about a lot of Epic collections, and I, idly I look a lot of them up on eBay, the ones that I don't have especially, and it's astonishing. Uh, and that is definitely true of the Epic Comic Book collection that we're that we're talking about today. We are going back to an Epic collection to to signal the return of Epic Comic Book Wednesday, and it's the Fantastic Four. Uh, we're going back to a Fantastic Four epic collection. I think, I like, I don't know if this is on Michael's mind, but I like the idea that we're going back to an epic collection to signal that we're back, that we're back to making these videos. And also, uh, I know that this dovetails with a project of his. Michael K. Vaughn is read, has decided to read his way through all of those canonical Marvel characters. From their first appearance to the, they all were, almost all of them are universally canceled for a ret a retconning event a dumb retconning event that marvel did we can talk about that but but uh they had a long run a lot of those things in one form or another had hundreds of issues he actually did it for thor the mighty thor all the way to the end from the beginning all the way to the end of thor and he is now doing it for the fantastic four which i if i remember correctly is his favorite marvel comic uh and which we have dealt with before on this channel <laughs> infamously uh i i did a teardown <laughs> of uh of another marvel epic collection that reprints the origin the first issue of the fantastic four the origin of the fantastic four where i uh tore that origin to shreds uh rather liberally <laughs> rather savagely i actually did it a second time on an epic comic book wednesday at, at mike's invitation uh i some of you have pointed out that I seem to be especially hard on Marvel origin stories. I did the same thing for Avengers number one. Uh, it, but it's the story of uh, a group of friends who take a rocket into near-Earth orbit, are bombarded by cosmic radiation, and when they come back to Earth, the radiation has given them superpowers. And the only reason that I really need to recount that basic origin story to you is because the Fantastic Four is one of the few Marvel creations that has not been successfully adapted to the screen ever. So you might have seen old Sony adaptations that were marginally... I think they had better, more, more good moments than bad moments. You might have, I don't know, in a drunken haze, you might have stumbled into the latest big screen remake of the Fantastic Four, which was horrifying from beginning to end, just horrifyingly bad, laughably awful. Uh, and you might, like me, be uh, terrified at what, what modern Marvel and modern Sony are going to do to the Fantastic Four uh, next year. I, I, it's just horrifying for me to think. For me to think of a, uh, it's, it's horrifying to me to think what they're going to do to the original story. Uh, What's up, baby? Who's my little Aunt Petunia? Hmm? Come down here. Oh, <laughs> what are you doing? What are you, are you going to jump over to your chair? You got to go over here to do it. There you go. <laughs> uh, that's the story of the Fantastic Four. It's Reed Richards who designed the rocket. Uh, he's a scientist. Uh, it, it's his fiancee, Sue Storm. It's her little brother, Johnny Storm, and it's Reed's best friend, Ben Grimm. But they aren't, they aren't best friends in in a casual sense they are they are kind of lonesome dove best friends they're they're as close as brothers to each other so the fantastic four is really a family it's not an element that that stan lee stan, stan lee when he created these archetypal characters his, his original stable of marvel characters sometimes he got what was their animating special thing sometimes he got that right away uh, and sometimes he didn't. Sometimes he needed to grow into it. I think with the Fantastic Four, it took him a bit of time 
to realize that it, that that was the key thing here. Uh, it's, for instance, not true with the X Men. It's not true with the Avengers. It's not true with any of the real superhero teams from DC Comics. It's not true with any of those. Uh, uh, and they have these powers. Uh, Reed Richards develops the ability to stretch his limbs to an enormous, enormous length. He becomes extremely pliable, a kind of low-rent plastic man. Uh, his fiancée, Sue Storm, who be eventually becomes Sue Richards, his wife, they marry in the, the course of Fantastic Four. Once Stan Lee leans into the idea that this is a family that you're watching, he thinks, well, this never happens, but why shouldn't they marry? <laughs> and why shouldn't we show it? Why shouldn't we have a big issue about their marriage? Uh, normal people get married if, if, they're, if they're in love with each other and they're fianced for a long time. Uh, she gains the ability to turn invisible and become a helpless hostage, hostage to, to every supervillain that stumbles across her, literally stumbles across her. It's only later, as she develops, that she becomes the most powerful member of the team. Uh, but at first, all she can do is turn invisible and maybe turn other things invisible. Uh, her brother, Johnny, gains the ability to burst into flame and fly through the air. He calls himself the Human Torch because Stanley was just plagiarizing a World War II character who had those same powers and looked the same way. Uh, so it, in, he was plagiarizing, but he didn't have enough meta-awareness in Fantastic Four number one to have anyone mention that. That would have solved it. It would have saved the moment. If, if he'd burst into flame and flown through the air, and Reed Richards or Ben Grimm, who served in World War II, had looked at it and said, hey, that reminds me of the Human Torch. That would have been great. That would have been a great moment. That's not in Fantastic Four number one. Uh, and then there was Ben Grimm himself, who changes into a rocky monstrosity called The Thing, who, again, develops over time. Uh, almost all of these characters, Reed Richards d doesn't really, his intellect develops over time. Uh, we gain, we get the impression as time goes on that not only is he a, a genius, but that he's the greatest genius, the most, the most amazing genius in the world as time goes on, but his powers don't change. Johnny Storm's flame gets more intense when he, when he is in the early issues of Fantastic Four, a uh, fire hose will put out his flame, uh, and the, he, his flame gets more intense. The thing grows much stronger. He is strong in the, first, in the early issues, but he gets ten times as strong as time goes on to one of the most physically powerful beings in the Marvel Universe. And the Invisible Girl stops. She's able to turn invisible, but she's also able to create an invisible force field and increasingly control it uh, to the point where it makes her uh, A-list powerful for a Marvel character. Uh, but none of that is true at the beginning. But it, it develops over time, and the Fantastic Four did develop over time. Stan Lee got more and more assured in what he was doing, in the interpersonal chemistry between all of the characters. They have to have fallings out, like families do. They have to have reconciliations, like families do. They have to not always get along with each other, but be there for each other in a pinch, like I'm told families do. They don't in Southie, but they do, I'm told, in other places. Uh, uh, and also the characters have to evolve. They have to get better at what they're doing. They start to develop and accumulate a rogues gallery of villains. The Red Ghost, uh, uh, Galactus, of course, the world-devouring Galactus, uh, the, uh, uh, the Wingless Wizard and the Frightful Four, a kind of weird supervillain counterpart to the Fantastic Four. Uh, and also, the name you're waiting for, <laughs> there's Blastar and there's Annihilus and a whole bunch of others, but the name you're waiting for is Doctor Doom. Uh, Stan Lee cast around for, he was really good at coming up with villains and he didn't care. If one didn't take, he could make up another one. And uh, he created a, a Middle Eastern despot named Dr. Doom. An armored despot who has a history with Reed Richards. They were briefly at school together. Uh, <laughs> slimy. <laughs> and uh, he then becomes a megalomaniac world leader. Uh when we see his origin story, his origin story that Stanley gives us later on says how he became disfigured, why he wears armor, why he wants to destroy the Fantastic Four and the rest of the world. That origin story uh, doesn't say how he gained control of his Middle Eastern European country. Uh, I'm assuming that it's because he had his followers fa falsify electors on election day or something like that. I don't know. It's never really been made clear. Uh, Doctor Doom is the focus of the graphic novel that we're looking at today because we're looking at uh, Fantastic Four Epic Collection, volume number five, 
uh, which is the title they gave to it is The Name is Doom. And there is a Jack Kirby cover. The actual, the actual cover said Victims. But that, that's a little bit too supine. So they, they called The Name is Doom. That's the name of this volume. And these are issues that are right at the end of the 1960s. The last couple of years of the 1960s. Um, and of course, the 1970s, we see both Stan Lee and Jack Kirby leave the Fantastic Four, which in the early 60s, and then especially in the mid 60s, 65, 66, that was unthinkable. It's just for those of us who were reading this book, then it was, of course, what do you mean, leave? It's unthinkable. Of course, I was thinking, well, do I really have to care about you? <laughs> yeah, you, the writer, or you, the artist, do I really have to care about you? You've got a book, it's a hit. Okay. Great. So keep doing this over and over and over again, ad infinitum. And if you leave the book, well, you know, have an office party, but make sure that your successor, who also won't be named, writes just like you. And if Jack Kirby is leaving the book, well, okay, we, we can go out on the town, but make sure that your successor on Monday morning draws just like you. No one's going to be named. It's just going to continue the way it is because it's popular. Not so in the Marvel world. In the Marvel Universe, it's all about us. It's all a rap session, man. <laughs> so so Stanley and Jack Kirby here in these issues from 67 to 69 are pretty much approaching their departure from the issue, from, from the comic. Uh, but they're not there yet. And this epic collection, uh, which definitely is an example of what I'm talking about. These This, is, this was, uh, what, uh, $40 when I bought it. And it's more than twice that now to buy it a copy of it uh i think uh stanley and jack kirby both stayed on the fantastic four and thor and a couple of other things past when they were even remotely interested past when they were doing anything more than phoning things in especially kirby but this graphic novel cuts off before that so this is issues uh 68 to 87 uh and i have a, a I haven't watched Michael K. Vaughn's video yet, but I have a rather a rather uh, contrarian interpretation of the issues collected in this volume, uh, which is that they are the high point of the Stanley Jack Kirby uh, collaboration on the Fantastic Four. I think they are. I think these issues. I, the the standard fanboy answer to that question would be no. The high point is forty five to fifty five. Not the years, but the issues. Number 45 to number 55. So something that climaxes at the peak in the middle with, with the introduction of Galactus. I don't agree. Especially from an artwork standpoint. Kirby's artwork in those issues is really good, but it tends sometimes to still be boxy. It tends to sometimes still be cramped. Also, his artwork was changing. Uh, that was another thing I frowned upon. His art was changing. Kirby's art still always going to be recognizably him but he was starting to want to do different things on the page innovative panel design innovative motion from one panel or one page to the next and uh that's not exactly how stan lee breaks down a story uh and if you do you do too much of that he's going to want to send those pages back to you uh let's talk about that no, don't do that either, baby. <laughs> We're still dealing with skin irritation issues. Baby, Frida, Frida, stop. Why don't you come over here with me? Come here. There you go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's good. Uh, where was I? Before we were on Psoriasis Patrol. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, Kirby's, Kirby's artwork is changing. Stanley's writing, bless him, never changed. But Kirby's artwork was changing in this block of issues. And really coming into its own. I have I have the heretical opinion that this is the best stretch on the Fantastic Four. So this volume is actually worth having. Uh, <laughs> I don't know that it's worth having for $100 to pay for a, simple, a single paperback issue. But, uh, and I won't say Stan Lee's writing never changes in its hokiness. But he did gain more assurance of what he was writing. That the Fantastic Four is a family and so things are shifting. You don't have... In the Justice League, you have a roll call. Here's who's in this issue. In the Legion of Superheroes, you have a roll call, and of course you can't have the whole Legion. So all these people are away on missions, and this is the cast that we have here, because you can't have 30 characters in every issue. Uh, the Fantastic Four is different. Here, things are organic. 
in this collection of issues, for instance, uh, Reed Richards and Sue Rich and Sue Richards have been married, and they Sue is pregnant. Another thing that's never happened in a comic: she's pregnant. So, you know, for her own safety, she's going to leave the team, uh, which temporarily leaves things with just Reed Richards and Ben Grimm and Johnny Storm. But Johnny Storm is also a hormone-driven teenager who has a girlfriend. That young woman. You've got five characters on Fantastic Four cover here because that young woman here is a young woman named Crystal. One name only, no last name. And she is not human. She is inhuman. <laughs> she is from a hidden race of beings that were in the 50 issues, that debuted in the 50 issues before these. They're hidden race of beings. They are an offshoot of the alien race of the Kree. They have been genetically manipulated. And they also genetically manipulate themselves. This isn't getting too far afield. They have a, a thing. The, the Inhumans have a thing called the Terrigan Miss. And as a, as a coming of age rite of passage, every Inhuman goes into the Terrigan Mist. They go into the Terrigan Mist looking basically like a human, which looks basically like a Cree. But they can come out looking like just about anything. They can come out as freakish or as transformed as could be, and no two the same. And the, the Inhumans are a royalty. They have a ruling family. Crystal is part of that ruling family. She is the sister of a character who has appeared in the Fantastic Four many times called Medusa, uh, whose hair is sentient and she can control it. So it's her, her hair is her power. Uh, Medusa is the, the consort and then later the wife of the king of the Inhumans, Black Bolt. Uh, and... So Crystal is part of the royal family, but she also is a teenager. Also, presumably, the, the Inhumans have hormones. So, so she is she's filled with hormones, and she and Johnny Storm fall in love. Crystal got off easy. Actually, you could say that Medusa got off easy too. She went into the Ter Medusa went into the Terrigan Mist. What if she'd come out of the Terrigan Mist as an actual Gorgon with living snakes on her head that can turn people to stone if they look at her? That doesn't happen. Instead, she comes out with luxurious hair. <laughs> and Crystal comes out looking exactly the same as she looked going in, a pretty young woman. But she has control uh, over an ability to generate or simulate the four classical elements, earth, air, fire, and water, to, to a degree that is never really clarified. So she can generate fire. Okay, so does that mean she can generate a flame as hot as the human torch? Uh, she can. She has control over Earth. Okay, so does that mean she can cause an earthquake like her cousin Gorgon of the Inhumans? It's never. It's never really made clear. She, but she is a heavy hitter. She can be a member of the Fantastic Four, and she, after a while, politely, it's always neat how polite she is. She she refers to Reed Richards and Sue Richards as Mister and Mrs. Uh, Richards. She never refers to them by first name. Uh, also, Mister Grimm instead of the Thing or Ben Grimm. Uh, she eventually insists in her quiet, polite way that she be made a member of the team with an, a uniform and everything. And that's the way it would happen, right? It would flow naturally in a family. There wouldn't be a formal induction ceremony. There wouldn't be a training ground or an academy or anything like that. It would just be, well, you're a part of the family, so of course you'll come along with us on our adventures. Uh, and boy, oh boy, are there great adventures in this volume. Oh, oh, oh my. Now, the volume ends with a multiple-part story about Doctor Doom in his Middle Eastern kingdom. And it's terrific. Just terrific. But there are a lot of other great stories in here. Standalone stories and also uh, multi-part stories. That character I mentioned, the Wingless Wizard, he's a, a brilliant scientist, apparently. He can make all kinds of doohickeys just like Reed Richards can. Uh the ability to fly with his technology he has no no powers of his own but his technology is his gloves make him super strong he can create a force field or bolts of energy he can fly uh and there's a motif that's repeated a couple of times in these issues where individual members of the of the frightful four decide they can take on the fantastic four alone without their teammates the sandman does that in in one of the issues that i think is in here maybe it's a little earlier than this and the Wingless Wizard does it a couple of times in these issues where he just decides, I don't need my teammates. I have enough gimmicks to take you all on if I'm careful about it. Uh, and almost succeeds. There, there is one, uh, there's one terrific moment. I noted, I noted it. Uh, I noted it when I was reading these issues originally uh, where we, we have to get uh, Crystal, the Inhuman, in on the action. Uh, 
And so we have her fight the wingless wizard. The wingless wizard has temporarily uh, nonplussed the rest of the team. Never, it's never really, never really seems all that serious that he can defeat them. Uh, but it seems like he's he stymied them just a bit. Uh, and she comes forward. Uh, let's see if I can find the moment here. Uh, she comes forward to show what she can do. Yeah, here we go. Uh, see, that's this is the guy in this, that dome helmet. It looks like it looks ridiculous. Notice this. We'll get back to this. That is lovely, but uh, just pay attention to it. Notice that's not nine panels on a page. That's one huge panel. Uh, but the the uh, the wingless wizard says, "I'll destroy the whole lot of them," and he's fighting against the uh, the Fantastic Four, and he's using these power gloves of his and and whatnot. Uh, and at one point, uh, he he decides to threaten Crystal all by herself. This is Jack Kirby artwork with Joe Sinnott inking, which is not a team up I usually like, but Sinnott is great in these issues. These issues are just fantastic, no pun intended, for the artwork. And he's threatening her. He's saying, I will use this on lethal force. And she lets loose. I was always a little disappointed by these cartoon lightning bolts, but she, she lets loose on him. And she also speaks up for herself. She says, you cannot threaten one who is sister of Medusa, one who has dwelled among the incomparable inhumans and faced perils without number at the side of the mighty Black Bolt. But most of all, you cannot threaten a born elemental. <laughs> uh, losing herself in hyperbole, as Stanley characters tend to do, because, of course, she's not a born elemental. <laughs> no inhuman is a born anything. The only inhuman... Let me show you the, the people that I'm that I'm talking about here. Because, of course, since Crystal is a member of, of the team, we get uh, we get a terrific story with the Inhumans. Uh, and we get to see uh, the ruling family there. There is Black Bolt. That is his consort, Medusa. That is Gorgon, whose hooved feet can cause earthquakes. There's Crystal in the background. There's Triton, who looks like a normal person when he goes into the Terrigen Mist. He comes out as a scaly fish man. And there is Karnak, a royal cousin who uh, is often uh, the subject of mistakes in people who talk about the Inhumans, maybe writers at Marvel who talk about the Inhumans these days, because Karnak is the only member of the royal family who did not enter the Terrigen Mist. His abilities are entirely naturally honed. Uh, it doesn't have any, any uh, augmented superpowers. But the reason that I pointed out that, uh, that big one-page panel is because Kirby starts to do that in every issue and then multiple times in every issue where he's telling the story that Stan Lee has given him to tell and they, we get these great uh, psychedelic late 60s backgrounds there, uh, these two-page spreads, but Kirby will be telling the story and then he will decide, just for the fun of it, to, to give Stan Lee a chance to write a longer something. So it would be a whole page uh, for a photo for an illustration and he ends up doing that on uh, in virtually every issue once upon a time for the Fantastic Four or any comic book the thing that that would, would do that would be this the splash page uh, but in these later Kirby issues uh, he does it several times in every issue as his own style is changing here we have a great full page spread of Dr. Doom at all of his various instruments there like that and it, it gives Stan Lee a chance to do more writing. I don't think it was done against Lee's wishes, uh, but it was. it's totally different from the 50 issues that went before this. Uh, here's another one where we get, we get a full-page spread of Dr. Doom. It looks like uh, he's undersleeping just a bit. <laughs> he's, he's really, he doesn't look his, his vim and vigorous self. Uh, so it was a joy to revisit these. You see, we get the, the captured in humans there, a whole page. Uh, it was a joy to revisit these issues, but the foremost joy for me is that uh, this stretch of comics here contains my two favorite issues from the Lee Kirby run on the Fantastic Four. I don't know what uh, I don't know what Mike will say about this, but I I, I we, we don't always agree on comics. I think that's part of the reason why the three of you watch these videos. Uh, but I wonder if we wouldn't agree. I wonder if we wouldn't agree with me. I'll have to check and see. I'll watch his video. I'll, uh, his video is always up by the time I make mine, so I'll leave a link to it. I think that the Lee Kirby run on the Fantastic Four is the best run on the Fantastic Four. I know that's probably not controversial to say, but there have been some humdinger runs after them, including George Perez and John Byrne. Uh, I think their run is the best. 
Uh, and this volume, the, this collection, what were the issues? Uh, 68 to 87 has, uh, just by coincidence, my two favorite Fantastic Four issues, which are back-to-back. Number 72 and number 73. I got number 73 uh, on the newsstands, Tro's new, Tro's Dry Goods Store, uh, for 12 cents. Uh, and uh, the the usual the usual antics uh, when I was buying comics. Uh, someone, there was always a someone. There was always a woman buying cold cuts or, you know, stationery at the counter, hair up to here, who would look over at me, then look to the guy who owned the shop, who was a friend of mine, and say, I thought you didn't allow dogs in this shop. <laughs> and he... he, he my dogs were always with me. They were always around me. They were always well behaved. They didn't. They didn't bay at anybody when I didn't want them to. Uh, but he, after a while, especially once he knew, he'd always talked about retiring. But once he knew that he was going to retire, uh, and that it was going to be relatively soon, uh, he had this comedy routine that was, I guess, a little bit unfriendly to his other customers, where they would say something like that: "Oh, you let dogs in here," and he would look around the room and then say, "I don't see any dogs." <laughs> Uh, but I, I was, I told him, I, the issue number 72, I was stunned. I thought it was just so good. And I remember thinking when I finished reading it, there's no way that issue number 73 will top this. Uh, issue number 72 is this, where soars the silver surfer? This great Jack Kirby cover there. And there we have our team dejected because not only has Sue Richards left the team, uh, but Reed has left the team as well to be with his wife. So it's just Crystal and Johnny and the thing. Uh, and their, uh, their reverie is interrupted by the Watcher, who appears in their living room, <laughs> to tell them that the Silver Surfer, the, the former Herald of Galactus, has gone nuts and is unleashing his mighty co power cosmic on the world. And here the power cosmic can levitate things, it can make things grow hyper fast, it can raise wind... Uh, tidal waves it can also in the course of these issues we see that that uh it can also put people to sleep i, I think the power cosmic has been changed until between now and then but i remember this big panel of kirby's look at that i remember looking at that i have this issue in a, in a box somewhere i think i showed it to michael Avon when he was here i have this issue just falling to dust but i remember when i read this back then just being amazed at the artistic decision to have no lines on this wake. The wake is just Kirby erasing a drawing of a line. That is just so awesome. I know that's commonplace but that now, but that is so awesome as a visual effect. The Silver Surfer goes insane uh, and apparently kills a whole lot of people. It's never really mentioned. Not only does he blast through all these buildings, but a second later, he sets a bunch of buildings on fire. It's... He's just their, their hale and hearty friend when the whole issue is over. I remember thinking that, too, that how odd that you let this guy go when, obviously, you should be incarcerating him if you can. He's just killed thousands of people. Uh, but the Watcher isn't done just with those. He, in order to thwart the, the menace of the Silver Surfer, he actually goes to Reed Richards and Susan Storm, which is kind of odd uh, for the, the Marvel era of comics. Kind of odd that he's not appearing in Avengers Mansion. Kind of odd that he has to take a husband away from his pregnant wife, as opposed to going to Thor <laughs> or the Hulk or something like that. But he does. He, goes, he slows down their train. Another great visual effect there. Uh, and tells Reed Richards that he has to help his friends. And there's a, there's a wonderful moment here, really hokey, uh, where uh, Sue Richards says, but, but what can he do against the all-powerful Silver Surfer? And the Watcher says, all-powerful? There's only one who deserves that name. His only weapon is love. <laughs> uh, so is is the Watcher a Christian? <laughs> is that was that what's going on here? Also notice John Romita John Romita Senior redrawing some bits and pieces here uh, to just to tone up the the panel. Uh, that was issue number seventy two. The, the team fights the Silver Surfer and eventually gets him to come back to his senses and realize. You know, you're not a bad guy. When we meet again, we'll be friends. They don't ever say, when we meet again, maybe we'll put you in the Hague for killing all those people. They don't They don't say anything like that. Uh, I guess in the Marvel, in the Lee Kirby era, every building in Manhattan is luckily uninhabited. <laughs> uh, but, and I loved that issue, and I had a bunch of other issues that I was reading, including real comics like Superman and action comics and World's Finest. Uh, so I didn't really think anything of it until the next issue, number 73 which is probably my favorite Fantastic Four issue. Uh, it's this. 
which I also have. I think I might also show the original of this to Mike. It's fall my original is falling apart. I have all the reprints this ever occurred in. Uh, this is a rare instance in the Lee Kirby era where the action is connected to another comic, not the, the previous issue of the Fantastic Four. The opening events of this issue take place in a Daredevil issue where Doctor Doom uses androids that look like the good guys. And that's the premise of this issue because the Fantastic Four is thinking that not only is Daredevil one of those androids, but anyone else who teams up with Daredevil is one of our androids as well and not their old friends. And so you get uh, this, the scenario of the cover. The Thing, the Human Torch, and Mr. Fantastic against Daredevil, Spider-Man, and Thor. Uh, which would ordinarily be no contest whatsoever, keep in mind. With Thor in the mix, it's no contest whatsoever. He's a god. Uh, but this takes place at a time in Thor's history where he had no powers. He had his super strength, but that's it. He couldn't, he couldn't fly, he couldn't command storms, anything like that. Uh, a good era in Thor comics, but, but this, this coincides with that exactly. And so, uh, the team, uh, has to fight these three and they think that they're dealing with androids. Uh, Daredevil is fighting them alone and then Spider-Man recruits Thor who can't fly so he has to he has to swing through manhattan with spider-man and he says i do not relish the prospect of waging battle against the indomitable fantastic four they have ever espoused the cause of justice and truth and spider-man says i don't like the idea of slugging it out with them either but mainly because they have a bad habit of never losing <laughs> and so they they the the battle finally happens spider-man and and daredevil decide well the thing is more your speed so thor you can take the thing Daredevil fights Mr. Fantastic, and Spider-Man and the Human Torch fight each other, and of course, they've fought each other many times. Spider-Man and the Human Torch are teenagers together, they are friends in the Marvel Universe, they have often fought each other. Uh, and we get uh, one of those panels where Thor and the Thing are fighting off. Uh, where Thor says, for Asgard and honor Imperial, and the Thing says, it's clobbering time, right back at you. But the Thing notices that he can knock Thor around. This doesn't. Something seems unusual, and the thing remembers. Oh, wait a minute! You said you lost your powers. Uh, I I remember. It's possible that someone uh, wrote a, a snotty letter into Marvel saying, "Well, Thor said that to Spider-Man. He didn't say it to the Thing. The Thing doesn't know that. Uh, you just." Uh, but anyway, we get a comparatively rare uh, instance where Jack Kirby draws Spider-Man. Spider-Man, I think, is one of the only great Marvel characters that Kirby couldn't draw well. Uh, he draws a chunky Daredevil, but <laughs> but nevertheless, his Daredevil is just a slugger, uh, and not anything else. Uh, who when when Mister Fantastic is entirely enveloping him, he still manages to find an electric weapon to attack him, almost giving away the fact that he has a radar sense that he he's blind, but he has a radar sense. And we get the Thing and Thor duking it out uh, for for just a moment. Uh, the Thing says what's keeping you on your feet, Curly? When I belt a guy, he's supposed to stay belted. You trying to give me a complex or something? And Thor says, Oh, most imperial sire, though thou hast made me less than godlike, still am I more than truly mortal. Though I have been forsaken by thee, neither th my faith nor my trust have wavered. Thus, in thy name, because I be flesh of thy flesh and blood of thy blood, the victory shall be mine. And, and for a minute, he's his old self, uh, against whom the thing would not have a chance. Uh, and the thing says, I don't get it. How can an android talk so corny? <laughs> and eventually they do, uh, eventually they do figure it out and, and all comes out well. And I just loved it. Oh my God. I loved that issue. <laughs> uh, and that is this collection. It's, it's the, the, uh, aftermath of the, what most fanboys would say is the highlight of the Lee Kirby Fantastic Four, the original appearance of Galactus. Galactus is in this issue as well. He finds the microverse and thinks he's come to an Arby's all-you-can-eat buffet. <laughs> uh, uh, it starts in the aftermath of the original appearance of Galactus, and it goes all the way to the doorstep of 1970. And in the 70s, everything changes. Lee and Kirby turn in some really bad Fantastic Four issues. I don't think anyone could defend them. They do the same thing on Thor. Really bad issues while they're wrapping up their tenure and finding replacements someone else to write the book, someone else to draw the book. Amazing ideas. Uh, and great issues come from that. 
uh, when when you get different artists here and different eras in the Fantastic Four, the, the team shifts all around. So, you know, I'm not saying that only the good, the old stuff is the good stuff. No, there are plenty of great eras in the future of the Fantastic Four. But I'm glad that whoever put this thing together did not include those issues. And I wouldn't be mad if those very final issues of the Lee Kirby co uh, collaboration on Fantastic Four are never in, the, in a, an epic collection. I wouldn't be mad about that at all. Uh, they shouldn't be. They shouldn't be remembered. They're not good. Uh, but uh, that is this volume. Uh, a wonderful, raucous return to form uh, for Epic Comic Book Wednesday. <laughs> so, uh, sorry to go on at such length, but it's rare that I get... Uh, this volume has my two favorite Lee Kirby Fantastic Four issues, so I had to go on at great length. Uh, plus the Inhumans and the Silver Surfer and Galactus, just a whole bunch of great stuff, and a whole bunch of great moments all throughout here. Kirby's artwork gets better and better as this goes on, until it falls off a cliff because he has his eyes set elsewhere, not because he gets less talented. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> I'm going to wrap this up. I've gone on too long. So I'll be back. We'll be back next Wednesday with whatever Michael K. Vaughn picks out next. <laughs> so I will see you then. <laughs> Thank you. Bitches.